This meeting is being recorded. Hello, all. I am Anna Yavornitsa. Used to be called Anya Snehova, but the Heralds decided they didn't like that name. So I'm now Anne from Mapleton is what it translates as, Anna Yavornitsa. Uh, the picture that I'm sharing is a lot of the work that I've done over the years, the samplers. And you can find the handouts at that link that's on the screen. Uh, I also have the link for the class handout and for the gallery, galleries of pictures in the chat. Uh, if you've missed it, hopefully, well, hopefully everybody is here now. Okay. I have been doing black work, which is the wrong name for it. We'll get to that in a minute. But I learned how to do the stitch when I was three years old. And in 1992, I took, actually 91, I took a class about how to do th this reversible style black work. And then I got the flu in 1992 and was bored out of my skull being in bed. And I went ahead and I actually sat down and really started. And on the very left hand side of that picture, that sampler there is my first black work sampler. It's obviously more of a hybrid than just the reversible. But that is my very first sampler. It's actually dated at the top, although it's cut off in this picture. Um, black work is two different styles of embroidery. Uh, black, as it's called in the United States, black work. Uh, the one style would be better called monochrome work. It's done all in one color black or red or blue or green or whatever on a neutral, usually white or beige. Uh, occasionally you'll see white on black, but in, in that style of black work. But the thing is, it's different from what we're talking about here because it's all kinds of different stitches. The reversible black work, which is sometimes called Holbein work, that's what it's called in Europe anyway, Holbein work or double running work is done all in one stitch. That's all you ever really need to learn. Uh, you may need to learn some other construction stitches to make things out of it, but to do the embroidery, really easy. Uh, the 15 second version of the class, okay, is you know how to do sewing stitch, running stitch, where it dips in and out of the fabric, okay, and it makes a dotted line. Well, when you get to the far end, you turn around, you come back and fill in the blanks. You go down where you went up and up where you went down and you end up with a line. If you look at this work, it's all lines. Now, they're not straight lines, um, unless you count the maneuvers at a snake with a broken back as straight lines, um, but it's lines. This is the current sampler I'm working on. And you can see in that in this one, it's lines. They go all over the place, yes, but it's all lines. I'm trying to undo the other pen so I can show you more of what's on this sampler. This is, like I said, this is the current sampler that I'm working on. Some of their partial designs and there are some finished designs. And there's the very first one up at the very top, which happens to be from an Italian sampler from the 1550s. Um, a lot of these other patterns are things that I'm working out from period pattern books and some that I just had in my own head and I wanted to do. So, um, oh, and this is from the, this section right here is from the last class I did on this. Hopefully that's visible. Oh, let me turn it around the other way because you see the line at the top. It's uh, that. It's, it's hard to see because it's not a complete line, uh, but that is the very first thing that we're gonna be doing. And let me roll this back up and pin it in place. Um, let me start with a little history first. This style of embroidery uh, started in the Middle East. The Islamic religion requires that you not use patterns that are representations of living things. So in the Middle East, they developed a lot of geometric patterns 
uh, and eventually they began to get away from it. But uh, it's that was the way it started. And let me find the right gallery so I can show you the interesting stuff that they started with. Uh, mm, come on. One of the one of the bad parts about doing this online is making sure that we can figure out how the tech is actually supposed to work. There we go. All right. Now this one is a little on the small side, but you can kind of see that it's not. Those might be sort of living things, but only sort of. And here are some of the geometrics. These are textiles. Well, the earliest one that we know of is from the 12th century. And these are all textiles that are from the Mamluk era in Egypt, which is 12th to 14th century. And after the Crusades, uh, Islamic textiles got traded all over Europe. Uh, this one, you're starting to see things that look more like uh, living things. Uh, birds, the cat, I guess that's a cat, plants. They, they, those are very much later. Uh, here's another geometric. Even actually this one, and let me blow it up a little bit so you can see it. This section down here, if you can see the mouse waving around, I don't know if you can, is actually writing. Uh, the Islamic writing, uh, the texts were really doable in this style of embroidery. Well, the thing is that after about the, after the early part of the 1400s, um, a lot of these textiles were seen by various people. And in particular in uh, Italy, folks got really fascinated with this style of embroidery and the peasantry started doing a lot of it. It's You see it first in towels and then uh, also some in, um, then you start seeing it in embroidery. And there is a picture on the screen that certainly isn't me. Uh, do you have your sound on or your, or your picture or something? We need to close those down because the, uh, it, make, it, it glitches things too much bandwidth. Yes, um, Having trouble no. figuring it out? Yes, I am. Um, how do I get rid of that? Uh, let's get to that also. I'm sorry? Mute you. I can mute you. I said the host could also turn off. You're muted now and everything should be. Um... Yeah, I don't, I, well, I'm not the host, so I'm the teacher. Okay, well, hopefully she can fix that. Okay, well, let's get back to this. Um, in Italy, which was I was mentioning before, uh, the, the style started up and they were also using the traditional patterns that they'd already had. Uh, from there, it spread to Spain and Germany. Um, and the characteristic of the earliest black work is that the patterns are really horizontal vertical. There are no diagonals in them. Like this particular one right here. Uh, like I said, very, char very characteristic. The later they get, and when they the uh, they get to like France and uh, eventually to England and Poland and so on, uh, this is a German one, which is still one of the very early ones. See how the the birds are so angular, that horizontal vertical. By the time they get to France and England, uh, and it gets later and later in period, uh, they they start seeing diagonals and. You can really, really tell the difference when you've got like these two patterns next to each other. The this one is Italian, uh, it's early. This one is English, and it's late. It's actually out of our period. It's past 1600. So I think that one is 1628 or something in that vicinity. So you can see the difference there. Uh, 
around the time that our period ends, the death of Queen Elizabeth, uh, the a bunch of things happened to the English economy, one of which was that silk got horribly expensive. And also, uh, the silk that they were dyeing with the black dye tended to disintegrate fairly quickly. It aged out and got bad, That which is why we don't have a whole lot of black silk embroidery from the tail end period. Um, all of a sudden, people started doing this style as they were learning it and doing their first samplers uh, in wool or in polychrome silks. Um, let me pull up the sampler gallery and I can show you what I'm talking about. Um, once it actually opens, there we go. Okay, that obviously is not black, but black work, Holbein style black work, the reversible black work does not have to be only in black. But up until about 1600, you're going to find it mostly in black. Um, and this is a sampler that's dated to the mid 1600s. Here's another one. Uh, this is more Italian and it has much less of the actual reversible black work in it. Although the birds, if you look at look at them up here at the top, those are edged with the reversible stitch. Another polychrome sampler. And here's one in white work, which you find with, th these are extant samplers, and you find the white work right along with the black work. Now, this is one where there's more of the reversible type of stitching. Uh, the gown of this lady in a crown uh, a lot of the flowers down here are done with reversible. And yes, some of it looks like cross stitch. It's not the cross stitch that we usually do. It is a long, it's called long armed cross stitch. Um, and you find it being taught by a lot of people at this time frame. Again, another polychrome. And here's one where the one, the bottom pattern, the third from the bottom, fourth from the bottom, the fifth, and then the one with the flowers that it, those are all done in black. And a lot of this particular sampler is done in the reversible black work. And again, here's another one in colors, the reversible style, but still in colors. So, and, all right, now this is the one that is sort of the, the sampler to end them all and uh, bring them in the uh, bind, uh, in the darkness, bind them, I suppose. This is called the Jane Bostock Sampler. Uh, characteristic because it has these animals at the top. It has Alice Lee born the 23rd of November being Tuesday in the afternoon, 1596. And Jane Bostock, her mother, uh, is the one who stitched this for her daughter. Not uncommon. It's a way of saving patterns. Um, and yeah, the, here you can see her name, although it's also d got pearls in it and so on. One of the things I really want to point out to you is toward the top edge of the sampler, um, there is Juno is what it says in writing. And below it, there is what is fairly obviously a dog. What I want to point out is that the dog is mostly a pattern of holes in the fabric. If you blow this up, let's see if I can do this. A little bit, it's letting me. Uh, the dog is mostly a pattern of holes, just like the little bird right here. And there's an elephant somewhere on this one. I don't remember now where, oh, here it is up here. The elephant right up at the top, it's a pattern of holes. And here's another bird. Those were originally black silk and the black silk is all disintegrated. Most of the rest of this is not, although you can see there's, if you can see the mouse, I don't know if you can or not. Uh, on the, the line that's just below the writing, there's several patterns where they've mostly disintegrated. Um, and you can see what they are by the pattern of holes. Um, might come back to this a little bit later. 
But why was this an, embro a, 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 an important embroidery style? Well, for one thing, it's easy to learn. They taught it to three-year-olds. I taught it to my own. I know they're not kidding. Um, you can, and by the time kids were six to eight years old, they were able to work as professionals. That sounds impossible, doesn't it? But they were doing these simple stitches, the background stitches, and we'll talk a little bit more about those. By the time the kids were 10 to 14 years old, they a lot of the time had their own shops. And by the time they were in their early 20s, they retired. Vision was destroyed. Same problem with uh, Bob and Lace, same same thing happened but they retired very wealthy and uh you know you don't really need good vision to chase kids and cook so that's some of what happened there um this state is a standard embroidery style right up until the advent of the industrial revolution so even into the 1800s, girls were learning this style of embroidery because it's reversible. It works beautifully for things like uh, napkins, handkerchiefs, curtains where you have to see both sides, placemats. Uh, and from the period, the, the cuff ruffles and the neck ruffles because they are seen from both sides. That's not the only place that this was done. As a matter of fact, uh, there probably are more examples of it in paintings at, at being done on things like sleeves and four parts where they were, it was not reversible. So let me pull up the gallery of the portraits and we'll take a quickie look at those. And one of the things I mentioned was sleeves. Ack, of course, now it doesn't want to share. There we go. I mentioned sleeves. If it will share. There we go. Um, this is one of the style where these, the long scrolling vines are probably outline stitch. Uh, or they may be couched work. It's hard to tell in this portrait, but it's it's possible in some. But the little filling patterns in here, inside of the leaves, inside the petals of the flowers, are all reversible black work. That was a style that was really, really popular, like 1580 some. Here's a fellow with a collar and black work. And another one with a pretty amazing collar and black work. And this probably is not the doubled running stitch style. Um, another fella, and this one probably is running stitch. Um, another collar. And having looked at this pattern very closely, it's a pattern from one of the period pattern books. Uh, the one from 1569, Nicholas Bisset has this exact embroidery pattern in it. This one, it's harder to tell, but she's got embroidery both on the ruffle and inside of her collar. Now here's one with sleeves, four part. She's got it on her smock. She's got it on her ruff. This is a lady who has a lot of black work going on there. And the, the what's on this lady's ruff is probably black work. The rest of it is smocking of some type. Um, okay, that's that same lady. Uh, here's an interesting, excellent example, um, sort of bouncing out of the portraits for a moment. This is in the v &A, the Victoria and Albert Museum. And it's an example of those long scrolling lines and then the repeating patterns inside the, the flowers. And a queen uh, of the SCA, I believe she was East Kingdom, but I'm not 100% I'm not certain. Um, and a close-up of her elbow, and those the flowers in there are just amazing. And yes, uh, this style of black work was often combined with gold work in those things. Okay, here is a very, very obvious black work pattern. This is a picture by Hans Holbein. It is one of the four extant pictures of Jane Seymour, and it's the other one, <laughs> the other pattern uh, for her cuffs because the, the, pat, the picture that we most often see, which is in England, this is in a German museum, 
The one in England has three patterns on the ruffs, on our wrist ruffs. This one has only the single one. Another set of cuffs, an extant jacket. And this is a painting, believe it or not, of black work, white work, and gold work in the, on her smock and inside the reverse of her coat. Another neck ruff. And again, this is a pattern from one of the period pattern books. It exists in Basse, but I think it was in the first pattern book, which I think is 1526. This lady has some wonderful stuff going on on her sleeves. Um, and as well on the front of her smock and on her ruff. An apron. This, in this, this one is Italian and you find things like this where the, the reverse of the pattern is picked out, um, which is, and it's in a combination of the reversible black work and the long armed running stitch. And it's usually called a CC work. Uh, Bess of Hardwick, a pattern on her sleeves. And this is a really fascinating one. This lady, Anna Meyer, that's her wedding dress. And she has bands and a cuff supporter and the band along the top and then an amazing gold work and black work smock. Here's some of the patterns closer up. Uh, and this pattern is found in a lot of the pattern books. Uh, this one as well, although it may not have been worked on uh, even weave fabric uh, because I've, I've played with it and it works better if you've got fabric that has more threads per inch going one way and and fewer the other direction. Strangely enough, that's her amazing cap. And this, this collar, and this is actually worked in the double running work. There are lines, uh, apparently it exists and someone who handled it says that it was worked by doing the lines of running stitch and then doing the gold work over the lines uh, so that the gold thread didn't wear through. Uh, there's the cuff. Again, that's a pattern that's in one of the pattern books. Okay, here's a guy with a collar and a kid who's really fancy and another cuff. Let's see if I can blow that one up a little bit. Oh boy, no, it's hard, really hard to see, but I've worked the pattern uh, and it again is one from a pattern book. Um, this is a picture that a lot of time is, is, is taken to be Catherine Parr. I'm not sure, uh, nobody really is these days, but the pattern inside her collar is one that actually is very similar to one in the Jane Bostock sampler. And then here's an amazing, I don't know what, how they did this part, all I can figure is it's smocked some way, but the amazing bands of the black work and then the stuff in between. Um, here's a set of sleeves that are not done in black. They're done more in a rust color. And this one, which quite often used to be called Catherine Parr and they're pretty sure it's not. Uh, the strawberries, if you look at it very closely, these little strawberries and strawberry flowers are an overlay fabric worked in black work that is put over her outfit, um, probably a, a, some kind of partlet. And you can see that there is also black work on her smock. Um, there's a collar and some cuffs and stripes on sleeves. Those are more common in the Italian. This is a more common English style. And I swear it looks like her arms are about three times too long in this picture. I don't know why. Um, but this great pattern on the inside of the reverse of her coat or collar, whatever you want to call it, um, actually is another one is often found in the pattern books, uh, grapes. All right, let's get down to some, let's how, how do you do it? Um, first thing is that you have to have your needle free of the fabric. <laughs> okay, uh, I want to show you how to start. This is a type of waist knot that makes it very easy to start and stop relatively invisibly. Although you would not want to use this knot if you're using 
uh, silk thread. Uh, silk thread is more fragile. This is the stuff that I've got in my needle is cotton floss because it's El Cheapo um, and it washes without running all over the place. The thing is that when you turn a piece of thread black or a piece of thread backwards, sorry, let me get this pulled because I started with a threaded needle. And no, if you're going to be able to see what I'm doing, normally in a class, we've got a little bit more room. But there are two ends of this thread together and the needle. And then at the other end, there's a loop. Um, you do that by putting the ends of the thread through the needle, both ends at the same time. Now, to make this waist knot that I'm talking about, you go down through the fabric. I'm showing you the back side. All right, see where the needle came through. And then you go up one square away. Can you see that? And if you're working on the right side of the fabric, which is the way I'm setting up this knot, um, you put it through the loop and pull tight. Now that's how that is what it looks like where you can use it like a waist knot. Back there, see. Um, but this is the right side of the fabric. I don't want the knot on the right side. I want to be able to have it on the back side. So I'm going to do it again. I'm going to go. I'm going to come up through the fabric instead of going down, coming up through the front, down one square away, and where'd my loop go? I just put the needle through the loop, see it pulling up, and there. Now I have a, now I have a knot. Okay, in order to do the stitch, I talked about running stitch up and down through the fabric. Um, if you have fabric and a needle at home, you can try this now. Just start going up and down, okay? Get yourself an inch or two up, whoops. Down, up, down, and try to consistently have your thread on one side or the other of the fabric. If you come up and pull it through, then you can go down through the fabric and back up without pulling on it. And then pull when you're on the top of the fabric, you see? Leave it on the top and that way you won't put the needle through it at an unusual time and end up with a knot. Now, I said it makes a dotted line. You see my little dotted line there? I'm going to cheat. I'm gonna use dip stitch and do a bit more. But a lot of you, I would guess if you've done sewing stitch, do sewing stitch as a dip stitch. Dip stitch means you go down and up and then pull, okay? I'm trying to do it fast so I have enough to show you. All right, now I'm at the far end of what I'm intending to stitch. Have trouble seeing what I'm doing, there we go. And I am going to go down where I went up and come up where I went down. See how it's starting to turn into a line already? And then you just go on. Down, up, down, up, down, up. See, it's a line. Now, 
I want to show you something that I don't think the camera is going to be able to show you. Uh, there are in the how to section on the Maps Creations website, there are some photos that are much closer of this. Um, <clears throat> but there is a trick to making the lines look continuous. You don't want to go through the thread. If you go through the thread, you get a line that goes like this. So what you want to try to do is go down on one side and come up on the other. So you're making like a rope. You go down on the, yeah, there's no way you're going to see that. It's down on the upside. And up on the downside and it makes a continuous line. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have photos of this. Is that stem stick? I wish I did. Okay, are we at a place where everybody, anybody has questions? Were you describing like a stem stitch in embroidery? Stem stitch? Um, okay, stem stitch is upside down back stitch. Uh, just a moment. All right. If you're working on Ada, Sorry about making faces. You go under two, back one, and under two, and, and back one to do back stitch. The other side of the fabric is going to have a a pattern that's a little different. So let me do it that way for a moment and then I can show you. Um, it's assuming I can see, pardon me, I had to take the glasses off. Okay, I don't know if you can see it, but I am working backwards. What I'm doing is going forward two and back one and then pulling it up. Okay, that is stem stitch. Um, and it makes also an around and around and around kind of a kind of a thing. But let's go back to this stitch again. Um, does anybody have any questions about doing the doubled running stitch, the whole bind stitch? Apparently not. I don't see anything in the in the chat either. Okay. So that's a line. Um, I often describe this to people as driving from Portland to K Falls, which doesn't mean anything to those of you in Lockhack or East Kingdom, but on I-5. Uh, I-5 is a long, windy highway, um, major highway. And if you drive from Portland to K Falls and back, you're going to get a straight line. Well, it's not a straight line, but you're going to get a line pattern, okay? But if you drive from Portland to K Falls and you stop in Roseburg at the convenience store and then you stop at the Michaels in Springfield before you get to Eugene and then you stop, I know, uh, and then you stop at uh, the, the shopping mall in, in Woodward, Woodland, whatever it is, and then you hit Commercial Street in Salem to go to the Chinese restaurant, you always come back to I-5. And that is the other half of the equation. How do you do these patterns? Um, and I will show you. If you, okay, first thing is do your line again, your journey out, do like an inch or so 
And when you're down at the end, okay, can you see it? Um, when you're down at the end and you turn around to come back, you're going to, let's see. You're going to take a step away. And come back. See it? And then when you get, and then the next one, you're going to step away and come back. Take your next stitch, step away and come back. Your next stitch, step away and come back. There. That is, the pattern is called combs. Uh, you see it a lot in the peasant embroideries, but they take it to another step where they uh, then put another line of it next to it and it makes little boxes. So the box stitch that you see a lot in the east of the Caucasus peasant embroideries um, is basically the same stitch. Now, that's the back side. It's a little comb. Front side is the same. So that's that's the, the two main patterns that you need to do. So while everybody plays with that for a minute, I'm going to go on and talk a little bit more about the history of it. The thing is that this particular style of embroidery existed alongside a lot of other ones. You've already seen that with the sleeves where the, it's the little, the insides of the flowers that were done with the repeating pattern stitches. Um, or with something like um, uh, the, the birds in that one sampler where the outside of the birds were done with the uh, reversible stitch, the doubled running stitch. Um, but the birds themselves were probably done with something else, some other stitch. Or a CC work where the outside of the areas that are going to be left blank uh, is edged with a double running stitch. Now, one thing I want to warn you, there are a number of books from the 40s, 50s, and 60s uh, that talk about black work that insist it was done in backstitch. Now, you can do it in backstitch, but if you're working on linen, and you remember that the picture that I showed you with the strawberries on the very transparent fabric, you're going to see everything you do on the back side on the front side as well. So, they weren't using it because if you do that, then it's going to look messy. Um, so they were using a doubled running stitch. Uh, the back stitch thing was disproved back in the late 60s, but the books are still out there. Okay. So just warning you ahead of time. And there are some people online who will tell you absolutely uh, two things about black work. One is that it was always done in back stitch. Um, which I've already told you isn't true. And the other thing is they will tell you it was never do done reversible, which is, I don't know how they can eat, you know, how they can even think that way because we have excellent examples. Um, not a lot, not a lot. The stuff didn't last very well, but there are samplers and there are covers from books. As a matter of fact, Princess Elizabeth, when she was 13, worked a, velvet cover for a Bible for, I believe it was Catherine Parr, I think. Um, and it was done first in the doubled running stitch. And then she worked a braiding stitch in gold over two lines of the doubled running stitch. So again, combined stitches in embroideries. Um, we know that one because they have the cover, a piece of the cover of the book and the back side of it, which is pretty obvious, only shows the doubled running stitch. 
Um, I have tried doing, assuming that that wasn't a doubled running stitch, but a back stitch. I've tried doing the braid stitch with gold work on top of a, a uh, the, the wrong side of back stitch and it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. So we're pretty sure she was using doubled running stitch. Okay, another little snippet. And this is about this fabric, which is called Ada. And actually the stuff I have is, is normally called grid Ada because it has a basting stitch um, that is uh, woven into the fabric as it's put together. Now, they did not have Ada fabric in period. I tell people to start on Ada, to learn on Ada rather than trying to use a, an even weave fabric like a linen or something when you first start because it teaches you the rhythm while you're still trying to learn the stitch. Um, and then when you do switch to doing it on even weave fabrics, it's a lot easier. Um, I've seen people try to fight it through and they drop the style of embroidery in, entirely because having to count threads when you first start is a problem. Anybody can count to one. Uh, not everybody can count to three, apparently. <laughs> and sometimes on the not quite even weave linens from period, it is very, very difficult. Um, I've had all kinds of fun doing it myself. So please start on Ada. Uh, once you feel like you really know how to do the stitch, then you're more than welcome to go over to the even weave fabrics. But I do have a justification for teaching people on Ada first. They created what we would now call prepared fabrics like Ada, which is a specific weave, by the way. But they created it with standard over and under weave, whatever that's called in weaving, I don't remember. Um, and there are extant pieces of the fabric already there. What they would do is in a loom, they would take three of the warp threads or four or five of the warp threads and then leave a gap. The next little slot would not have a thread and then the same number and the same number. And then as they're putting the shuttle back and forth through the loom, uh, every third or fourth or fifth stitch, they had a little comb. They were made um, actually now modernly, they're made with toothpicks um, <laughs> that, that are, are drilled, in, uh, little holes drilled in a piece of wood and then they take this comb and they drop it into the warp and then they put the shuttle through the next time, however many times, one, two, three, four, five, and drop another one in. And then once they've tamped it back down, then they start leapfrogging them. It leaves the fabric with small holes, which was supposed to be right under my hands. And I don't have it here, apparently. Um, you sometimes still see fabrics like that, uh, especially uh, manufacturers like Charles Craft uh, have done a number of things where they do like, um, uh, they're intended for lap robes, uh, a piece of fabric. It's intended for a baby blanket or a lap robe where they have one square that's a standard weave and then the next square is more like woven more like Ada. Um, there are also a lot of time curtain fabrics, lightweight curtain fabrics that are woven with holes like that in them. Okay, hopefully those of you who are stitching along have finished your combs. And now we're gonna try a pattern. It's a little bit different. I'm hoping you all have called I have uh, called up the uh, the class handout because I'm going to try to share the screen here once I find the right page. There we go. Back up one. Okay. Um, and I need to look at one page, not 16 pages at once. Okay. Um, screen share. Share screen. Oh, there we go. This is one of the pages of your handout. If you look right under where it says Black Work Learners Kit, you can see that I've got the stitch, the basic stitch there, and how you turn around at the end and so on. 
The little bit to the right of it is the combs. Uh, and you can see all the way at the right of the page where it says D, E, and F. There's combs. There's a multiple set of combs, one on right on top of the other. So you can see it's like the box stitch. And then here is a simple pattern. It's a simple acorn that's done with those combs. Okay. The pattern square that is down toward the left, left-hand side bottom, is the easiest one of the patterns to do. Um, it's the first one I teach people. And what you're going to do is take one stitch to the right, one stitch up on the diagonal, one stitch to the right, and one stitch down on the diagonal. diagonal. And that's Oh, heavens gracious. Now, how do I show you? Just a moment. <laughs> Stop sharing and then share a screen, but I want a different one. Actually, no, I don't. I want just the camera. So why does mine say Chris, Chris's stuff bleed snake and it doesn't show my Okay, can you see it there? Uh, under my finger, there's the one stitch to the right, uh, and then one stitch on the diagonal, one stitch to the right, one stitch on the diagonal downward. And this is what it looks like on the back. Okay, wow. I'm having trouble with a little tiny window, which is all I can see. All right. I'm going to go ahead and try it. And I'm going to set up about an inch of it and then start my way back. One of the interesting parts of, of doing black work is that the a lot of the time when you when you start the pattern, the journey out doesn't look like anything. OK, it. Like that. OK, it's just stitches. But now I'm going to turn around and come back. And I'm filling in the blanks. And I just committed one of the cardinal sins. I just managed to put the needle right through the thread. So I've got a lump. OK. And as you stitch, it begins to show up. It's starting to look like a pattern. OK. So go ahead and try it. Um, and now that I've gotten to the end of the line, that's what it looks like. OK, I'll do a little bit more show and tell here. I mentioned the. Um, Jane Bostock sampler. Well, this is this coif is made with patterns from the Jane Bostock. Remember that line that was pretty much all just dots and a few little bits of thread left in it? That's this pattern right here. Um, this pattern, the um, carnations, and this pattern, the grapes, are alternated with a sort of a Celtic knot thing in the Bostock. Here I chose to alternate them with a smaller frame. Um, the interesting thing is that while this pattern is, there we go, is completely reversible, and I will show you. Okay, completely reversible. The carnations are not. You see the, the sort of messiness that's going on in here. Front side, it looks it looks all the same. But what ha has happened is that these little filler stitches don't quite match up. 
uh, going back and forth. You, you're not filling them in. This is what's called a darning pattern. And yeah, it really did exist back in the Mamluk textiles. Um, and the weird part is that it didn't show up in embroideries for about 200 years. And then the English started doing this and it showed up all over the place. Go figure. We're not really sure at this point whether somebody ran across uh, a one of the older Islamic textiles that had the darning patterns, or if somebody just decided it would look cool and it didn't matter what it looked like on the back. We don't know. Um, but knowing people, we find ways to make things look cool. But um, yeah, these are a couple of my favorite patterns. And oh, and so you know what it looks like when I put it on. Here. Okay. And it would be gathered up underneath my hair. Um, the uh, and yes, this does go on top. Okay. Any questions anybody has? Anybody out there that's actually done some of the stitching and can show us? Okay, not seeing any. Okay. Um, I wasn't going to oh, show it, but I was going to say I, I loved it and I, lo I loved doing it. It was really fun so far. And I loved wearing your cuff too at the, um, the demo. That was amazing. Oh, the pictures of you look just really cool. I love um, it. Wanted to show you something else. Um, you probably recognize those grapes. Those are I, I, the same on the coif and the carnations, same on the coif. The, the other things here, and I'm, I'm trying to get it the right place. The other things here, the little strawberries and the line of mushrooms, believe it or not, and this other flower are also on the Jane Bostock. And this is just a framed picture. Okay, um, practical things you can do with black work. Uh, coifs, yeah, ruffs, cuffs. Uh, there's actually a gallery in the project section on the Maps Creations website. The uh, cuff uh, or the neck, neck band and wristbands that I did for uh, Seamus and Turk when they were princes of the summits. And also in that same gallery are some of the little pouches that I made also in blackbird patterns for them and their families uh, as a memento. Um, yeah, pouches are great in this. Uh, they did sweet bags and we don't have a whole lot of extant ones. There actually is only one in one of the German museums that I know of that is done in the double running style. Um, but there are a lot of other sweet bags that still exist. The fancier ones got got kept. Um, a lot of the patterns that you find when you first start are pretty simple. Uh, they kind of have to be when you first start, but this is a good use for them. There's a bookmark. It's a piece of edged riband um, with ribbon ends clamped onto it and tassel and a little dingle dangle. And I have a ton of them, some of which, <laughs> see what I mean by a ton. Um, uh, some of which are going for largesse and some of which are going for sale. And it's kind of, I kind of did like a sampler um, with them, uh, doing them just one after another. Ah, here's one of the snails. I love my snails. And one of the cool things is, okay, I'll come up real close so you can see them. See them? One of the really cool ones is that when you're doing a bookmark, it really needs to be visible on both sides, and they really are. Here's another snail. It'll come loose from the one it's stuck to. Okay. So practical and a good way to put in a lot of mileage on your needles um, is to learn how to do stuff like that. 
Samplers are also really, really practical. Um, the reason that this is tied up, this is my first sampler, and I mentioned it earlier. But the reason it's tied up is that when I throw it in my work basket, it works just fine like that, um, all tied up. And I just, this is a piece of old cut up broom handle <laughs> that I'm winding it on. But uh, I wanted to show you the, the uh, beginning of it. And like I said, this was the first one. And you can see what I was learning how to do, um, working out uh, the, the journey out, journey back on some of them um, and keeping track of how I was doing it and more patterns and more patterns. And anyway, when it's rolled up like this, it goes in my work basket, it's a notebook. Um, one of the famous educators from the time period that we study was a man named Jan Komenius, uh, Jan Komensky in Czech, uh, but he was really these the beginning of pedagogy as a uh, path uh, at a, uh, a vocation uh, in more modern times. Um, yeah, the Greeks and the Romans had their educators, but other than people in the universities where they had a specific way they did things, people weren't, there wasn't any one way to do things. But a lot of what he talked about ended up in things like Montessori and Waldorf school philosophy. Um, but he also said at one point, man writes with a pen, women, woman writes with a needle. And that's really, really common um, in the late period. When I was in Prague, one of the things that I ran across that I have talked about ever since, because it was just absolutely wonderful to see, uh, in the stacks below, in the climate controlled rooms, in the stacks below uh, the Clementinium Library um, in Prague, uh, there were a lot of really fun things that I got to see because I told them what I was studying. And this one case had three rolls of fabric that were about that tall. They looked like those rolls of quilting fabrics, you know, that you see now at the fabric store. But they had a little stick right through the middle. And the docent, uh, I said, what on earth are those? The docent unrolled them. And what they were was business records. The woman, her, and they have the, the paperwork and everything for it. Her husband died and she had to take over the business. So she stitched, you know, a, a, uh, any, a little wheat symbol. And then she had a little tally next to it, stitched in with a needle on the fabric. And that was her records for the two years that she was unmarried. And as soon as she remarried, apparently her husband took over the books and that was that. Talk about different, but it's fun stuff. Anyway, so let's see, where do we go from here? Pattern books. Well, actually the, the next class is where do you go from here? And at, when I do that class, we talk a lot about things to make and what to do. I usually tell people when you start to do a sampler. Uh, mostly because that's probably the fastest way to get your mileage in. And I talk about mileage, I mean it. Um, when you get obsessed with this, and of course, where did it go? When you get obsessed, oh, here it is. When you get obsessed with this form of embroidery, uh, you just need to keep stitching and stitching and stitching to learn what you do and you don't want to have to get bored go ahead and play find all kinds of patterns but what you're going to end up doing is before you really are an accomplished person at doing this style of embroidery um, you're going to use up all of that um, which sounds like a lot and yeah it takes a while uh, most people it takes about a year but the thing is, at that point, you'll pretty much know everything there is to know about how to do this stuff. I had this other sampler out here because this was the second sampler that I worked. And I'm starting from the bottom. OK, I, I'm reeling it. Um, a lot of these patterns were things that I really wasn't sure 
how to do the patterns. I just kept playing with it until I figured it out. These, believe it or not, are almost entirely out and back patterns. Um, on the acorns here on these two, the little side trip across the base of the acorns, the only side trip. Um, and obviously I was doing a lot of acorns at the time. I worked out how to do this pattern. This one is easy. And if you take a look at it, it's just nothing but a wavy line. And here, this one is two of those lines that you were just stitching facing away from each other. You can also stack them one on top of the other. Um, crenellated pattern. Uh, here's two zigzag lines stacked on top of each other and facing away from each other. And more, and more, and more, and more. Like I said, this was my second one. Um, so I hadn't been doing it all that long. There are a number of books out there that will teach you how to do black work. There's a lot of stuff online. I do recommend Kim Salazar's books, the New Carolingian Model Books 1 and 2. Uh, there are patterns that are everywhere from beginner level up to really advanced. And I've been playing with some of those and going, oh my goodness, um, how, how am I supposed to do this one? Um, but it's mostly just keep at it, keep at it, keep doing it. Uh, if you need patterns, if you need ideas, uh, go ahead and get hold of me on Facebook or drop a comment on the Maps Creations website. I'm not over there every day, but usually at least once a week. Um, if you have a have a comment there. Um, Let's see, what else do I need to, just a moment. Yeah, and oh, I need to say, there is a fourth pattern on that sheet where you have the, uh, the one that says Black Work Learners Kit. You did three of the patterns. There is a fourth one to play with, to try. And then there's another whole page of patterns that are really kind of fun to work out. Um, also a glossary and, and so on in there. Okay. Um, oh yeah, one more I did. I two more. I want. I meant to say something about because I've been playing with this for a long time. I do cross commercial announcement. I do things like jumble pages like these, uh, which are pretty inexpensive, and I have a number of pamphlets that have patterns in them, which is what this sheet is from. Um, and you can go play over on the rest of the site if you are so inclined. Uh, or just go ahead and write to me and I'll send you some patterns because I love to share this stuff. It's fun. Uh, and I had one more piece that I did want to show you because this coif has been sitting here this whole time. This was actually the first coif that I made and I didn't do it quite right. Um, it's also been rolling around on the grass at Shrewsbury, which is what I'm picking off of it. Um, the shape of the coif is not right, but the pattern on it is from Kim Salazar's first New Carolingian book. And the funny part of it is that there is 380 hours of stitching in this coif. Okay. And it's a wonderful pattern, but only 160 hours of the stitching shows because it was so complicated, I had to keep taking it back out. Um, so even though I spent 360 hours or 380 hours on it, only 160 of it shows. And that is part of the secret to black work is being too stubborn to quit when you get mixed up, set it aside, do the next pattern. That's the other advantage of working on a sampler. You can always ro roll it to a clean place and start a new pattern. And you know you can see that in even in this sampler that I've been stitching on tonight, where like this this pattern's only halfway, um, or back up here where I was playing with things where is just the start of a pattern here and here. I have those somewhere over there. Those are I'm working working them out um, from a pattern book. Oh. 
Okay, one of the ones I forgot about, because I, I did mention pattern books and then I sidetracked myself. One of the things is that starting in 1523, which is, I believe, the earliest one of the pattern books, there were a lot of pattern books published in Europe. Um, most of them have just a few pages uh, that are double running patterns, but but all of the other patterns were translated through all kinds of stuff. You see them in weaving. You see them in knitting. Uh, you see them in fillet crochet. Um, you see, uh, or not fillet crochet, what do they call it? In period laces. Then, and fillet crochet is a fake for laces. Um, you see them in, on uh, patterns that are painted on the walls. You see them in patterns that are carved into furniture. Uh, you see them uh, interpreted in metalwork. There's actually apparently one pattern uh, that it's a repeating leaf pattern, acanthus leaves, that shows up in a piece of armor. Uh, <laughs> the, I remember seeing it and going, really? Uh, there are even some of the patterns that are translated into things like uh, the repeating patterns on columns. Uh, when Azolt was in Italy the last time, she sent me a, a photo of this building that had three columns that were covered with blackwork fill patterns. And, and unmistakable. Um, so pattern books, they were used all over the place for all different kinds of things. And you are, it's perfectly respectable to go ahead and take a pattern that's not a black work pattern and turn it into one. Matter of fact, when my kids were learning how to do the stitch, what I would do is take a piece of fabric and trace a coloring book pattern on it and then let them stitch around the lines in the coloring book pattern. So you can find inspiration everywhere. Um, one of my favorite patterns that I worked out back in Oh, 19, well, 1962, actually, uh, is a tile pattern from the floor of the second floor hall. It's not a great hall, but it's a hall uh, at Karlstein, Karlstein Castle. And I looked down the floor and I went, oh, that's a blackwork pattern. And so I have a blackwork fill pattern from there. Um, okay, so that was not the most coherent run through, I think, that I've done in this one. Anybody have any questions? Anya, there are a few questions in the uh, in the chat. And the first one that's there was, how many threads of DMC floss do you use? Uh, one, uh, if you're using this type of fabric, if you're using 14 count data, which is sort of a standard, you're going to use one, one strand of floss, uh, 24 to 36 inches long, doubled over. Put the two ends through your needle. If you okay. are using silk, you are going to use two strands of floss, um, but it's going to be harder. You're going to have to do some kind of a knot on the back of the fabric. You can do, a waist, uh, do the waist knot a distance away and cut it and then thread the ends back through or you're going to have knots in your work. Um, if you're using sewing thread, use one piece of thread doubled over for this scale of fabric. Okay, and you started to touch on the next question, which was how do you end each strand? We saw how you started it, so there was no knot, but how do you end it? I'm sorry, I forgot to do anything about that. And I will show you. Well, I'm going to make a mess a little bit on my sampler here. I'm going to get a big nasty knot right there. See how I have that the straight bit there. Um, if you're familiar with whip stitch, you go under the threads without going through the fabric. Pull it tight. Go under the next one. And pull it tight um, and normally I will go five to six stitches and then 
My freight check has wandered away. I had some right here on the desk this morning. Um, I cleaned everything up for the class and I, that was one of the things I put away. Uh, there is a product out there called Free Check. In period, they use beeswax, but it does harden and give up eventually. Um, but what you do is you, and there's a bit about this in the resources and how to on my website. Um, but when you've gotten that far, go ahead and run a little bead of the Free Check down it and let it sit for just a moment or two, then tug it tight, just like I'm doing here, and then you'll snip it. Now, if you don't have Fray Check and you, uh, you see it? So it's sort of invisible. Uh, if you don't have Fray Check, it will eventually try to work itself out. And I'm trying to get my other sampler so I can show you what it does. Um, because when I started, I didn't know about Fray Check. Okay, just a moment. I want to roll it up to the right place so it's easy to see. Okay, you see that sort of lobster claw pattern in the middle there? If you look on the back, you see the dark spots? It's hard to get flatter. Um, the dark spots are because it started trying to work its way out of the thread. Now, some places it's more obvious than others. On this pattern, and I'll show you the front first. Okay. And then this is the back. Now you see the darker spots? There's one in here. That's where I ended. There's one off to the side over here where it's really obvious because it's started to whip itself out. That's what happens if you don't use the fray check. Um, so I would get yourself a bottle. Uh, you can get it online from Joann's. Michael's carries it. Um, so how far do you make your first journey before you start your way back? Okay, that was the next question. Um, however far you want to. Um, if you're going to do a sampler, uh, if you're just learning how to do things and you're doing a sampler, do it the full width of the sampler. Just all the way across. Um, I'm only doing it a short distance here because of the fact that I'm just trying to show people how to do the, the stitch. Okay, so you can go all the way across your fabric. You can go with some of these patterns like this pattern. I will work my way all the way around and up and down and around and up and down and around and I got all the way over to here before I turned around and came back. Whoop, let me pull it up so you can see it. But you see, I started over here, I ended up here. And then I turned around and came back. Um, or if you're doing something small, uh, just a moment, I'm trying to find a, one of the simpler patterns. There we go. Um, if you're doing something like this pattern, you're going to go all the way to the far end of the bookmark doing that up and down line. You see, see how it goes? Wait a minute. Let's see if I can hold it so it's possible to see. Up and down and up and down and up and down. And you're going to go all the way across. And it, as you come back, you're going to, right here, you're going to go to that convenience store in Roseburg. And then you're going to the Michaels and Springfield, you know, etc. And the, the heart itself is a little side trip and so on and so on. We'll do those on the way back. Does that answer that question, Cindy? Siglinda? Okay. Oh, not hearing an answer. Um, the snail pattern. Um, I, okay, Karen, uh, Go ahead. Um, <laughs> let me see. What's the best way to get hold of me? Um, over on Facebook, uh, if you post either on the Audiantum page uh, or uh, 
uh, that name. <laughs> I know it's very long. Uh, just copy and paste. Um, if you send me a friend request over on Facebook uh, and then ask me for the snail pattern, I will get it to you. And there are several of the snail patterns. So the other thing is that I am working on a jumble page of snail patterns. Um, hopefully another month or so at the worst, uh, I'll be able to start printing and then uh, you can get one from the website. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, not hearing any. any. Um, happy stitching. I hope you all have fun with this. Uh, get hold of me if you have questions or you need, need more patterns or whatever. Um, I have a lot of them just saved out and you know, you just send you a couple. And go th and check through the galleries, the project galleries, to see the kind of things you can do, the kind of projects. Um, it's not just the pictures for the classes, but if you go to the, um, let me see if I can share this just a moment. Of course, it's arguing with me. Why do you not want to? There. Oh, for heaven's sake, just a moment. <laughs> Oh, you gotta love computers, or you gotta hate them, one of the two. Um, it's not what I was trying to, let's see. Now it does not want to let me share the right page. Let me try again here, let's see what I got. Arg. Um, okay, can you all see something that says galleries of pictures for classes? Not yet. Okay, it is. I'm sorry, it just does not want to share the picture. I don't know why. Um, let me try that again. Maybe I got, I did that wrong. Ah, I found another. Good now. Um, hi, Anya, you've gone silent and your screen looks muted. There. <laughs> uh, apparently, it really doesn't like, like me. Um, I'm sorry, I can't share that as well as I thought I could. But you saw what the page looks like, and I hopefully you saw the the uh, cursor running back and forth at least, right? Yes, we did, Anya. Okay, um, because there's resources there, there's galleries there, all kinds of stuff. Okay. Um, Oh, it jumps from six to eight when trying to do the grid stitch that's with the acorn. Yes, uh, the this, this scale does change. Um, and yeah, where is stitch seven in the grid pattern? I'm not sure where it is, actually. Um, I'd have to go back and, and hunt myself. Um, but basically the acorn, if you do the outside of the acorn as you're on the way back, do that comb stitch across the acorn and back. Um, and I think, I think you'll, you'll see what it's looking like. And I do know one thing I'm gonna do next time, I'm gonna bring my plastic canvas sampler 
and so I can show you some of these stitches larger. Ugh. Okay, I am assuming that Ilantha is going to want me to do the second one of these classes at some point this fall. Uh, so keep an eye out um, or friend me. Um, I put my name in the chat, uh, friend me on Facebook, um, and I can let you know when we're going to do this again. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much for recording this. I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Anya. We'll see you later. You're welcome. See ya. Soon, I hope. So, trying to figure out how to stop the recording. Oh. I'm going to stop <laughs> the recording now. Okay, thank you.